Good morning to all. Uh, uh, we've been having a wonderful week of weather, and uh, I'm assuming Sunday will be just like that. And I'm assuming you're listening on Sunday morning. So, uh, yeah, I'd like to open up with a little bit of devotional and uh, just uh, being Advent season. And the theme for today is peace. I look for looking for something to... For that, I come up with uh, Micah 5, verses 2 to 5, and then one verse out of John chapter 14. I'd like to read them. Micah 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Epaphra, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be a ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Therefore he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord. In the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And this one shall be peace. And then John 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Rather, nor, neither let it be afraid. And then just a short reading. Uh, how to find peace this Christmas with everything that's going on around us, with, this, with the pandemic and so on. I thought it was very fitting. How to find peace this Christmas. Micah prophesies a ruler will come from Bethlehem, one who will shepherd his people and bring peace. And as Micah 2 says, But you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from old, from ancient days. Christmas celebrates God fulfilling this promise, but rarely do our lives reflect it. Somehow the happiest season of all has become the most stressful season of all. We sing about peace, yet rush through each day without it. But what if this Christmas could be different? Philippians 4, 6, 7 reminds us, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The social pressure to buy everyone a gift, go to every party, and fulfill every holiday tradition isn't going away. We bring peace to the chaos by learning to pray before we plan. God wants us to be involved in every situation, including how we celebrate him at Christmas. And Jesus is our source of peace, so talk to him and read his word. Promises, he promises he will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. The prophecy in Micah is a promise to us. We too can enjoy the peace Jesus brings in any season of life. So we need to look to him for our, our peace, and especially at these t days that we are in. It's sometimes hard to find peace, and uh, how do we know we can trust him? Well, my little bit of reading I find that there's 300 prophecies talking about the Messiah. Just think of that, 300 prophecies, and he has to fulfill every one of them to be the, pro the Messiah. And the odds of that, from what I've read, is a number with 125 zeros after that. Pretty much an impossibility, and yet Christ has fulfilled pretty much every one of them except the last few. And uh, so we can trust him and we can have peace in knowing that he is in charge and he is here with us today and his word is true. 
just open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come before you and we thank you for this day and the opportunities we have to serve and to read your word and to listen to your word and sing your praises. And uh, as we uh, fellowship uh, today, may you just uh, bring your peace into our lives and uh, may we just recognize that and just uh, trust in you. And uh, may you bless our worship service This morning, in your name, I pray. And at this time, I'd like to call on Danae to to come forward and to lead us in singing for this Sunday morning. Good morning. Please join us in worship this morning. sing Redeeming Love.
Next, we will sing O Holy Night. <clears throat> song will sing to God be the glory. Don't
worshiping with us. Thank you, Denise and Carolyn, for leading us in that singing. And uh, now, just for a couple of announcements uh, for this week, uh, the church board has decided to cancel services for the next while, and we will be notified of when we will resume again. And the offering is, as it's been for the last while, you can put money in Rosella's mailbox or mail it to Box 1478, Eltona, R0G0B0. Or if you want electronic uh, fund transfer, you can contact Rosella for information. And that is it for the announcements that I have here now. And in our prayer corner, we find uh, Ernie and Elma Buhler and our new parents. And the missionary couple is Bob and Karen Taves. I'd like, just like to take a moment to pray for each of them. Father, we just thank you for your willing servants. And we have uh, Ernie and Elma here this morning. And we just want to pray for them and thank you for their participation in our congregation. And for Ernie, for serving on the uh, EMMC Council. Uh, he's taken up that position and... Uh, May you just uh, be their guide, and may they be a light for you in the year ahead, and uh, may you just bless them in their service. And just also for the new parents that uh, we've had coming to our church this year with the young children, we are thankful for them, and uh, just pray that uh, we might be a support to them as they raise them in a godly way, and uh, just... uh, that they may be blessed by the little ones. And Lord, just also for Bob and Karen, as they are are serving in various Asian countries, but at this time they are limited to Canada. They can't uh, go travel and support the missionaries like they did before. And uh, we just uh, ask that you would uh, continue to give them uh, a joy as they serve where they are and uh, just uh, that they might continue to be a help to the missionary couples out in the field who are out in their countries and uh, just, uh, yeah, may you just bless them as they continue to work in your name. Amen. Now then, at this time, I'd like to call up Dene for the missions report, and after that, uh, we'll have the Advent, and Scott will come up to present the Advent. Good morning, Bergfeldt. It has been a while since I've stood in front of you talking about Central Asia, so I will give you a bit of a recap on the last year and a half. I left Canada June 2019 and was overseas for nine months, where I spent Most of my time focused on language studies while building relationships with a few specific people, my language helper and her family, my host family that I lived with when I first entered the country, and a few young women who are believers. I had planned for my first term overseas to be several years long, but that was cut short in March this year when I had to leave my country to obtain a new visa, and when I could not return to my country because of COVID, I then made an unplanned return to Canada. Each month since March, I've been expecting and preparing to return in the next month or so, but as each month progresses, the door has not opened. So from May to August, I took an online course that taught about Islam and how to better interact with the people of Central Asia, and since May, I have also been working casually on the farm. I have enjoyed visiting friends and supporters, speaking about Central Asia to different groups, camping and hiking, lots of time with my nieces, and some informal language study. It has been difficult to study language because the language I'm studying is not widely known. I wasn't able to find a teacher in this area nor through the online platforms that have become popular and necessary in the last year. But in October, I made a connection with a friend of a friend who lives in Moscow. For the last two months, once a week, we've been meeting through video to have language class. It has been great to be able to converse in the language to refresh my memory and also to make a new friend. 
In spring, my co-workers in Central Asia took a break from their work in ministry because of COVID restrictions. They closed the skills training center for a few months and spent more time together outside the city, often exploring and hiking in the mountains. In summer, they were able to reopen the center and resume the sewing, knitting, computer, and English classes. The economy has really suffered because of border closures. Food prices have gone up. People who usually work in Russia and send money home weren't able to go to Russia in the spring. Crops were poor this past summer because of drier conditions, and there are electricity shortages. While the country was slow to admit that COVID was present, by now it has swept through the country. One of my friends told me last week that almost everyone she knows has had it. But in the midst of all that, there has been good happening. One of the believers, Ruby, that we are discipling, has been living with an abusive husband for a few years, and the team has been making efforts to get her out of that situation. But this summer, her husband has started meeting with the men on the team, and the couple together has been coming to our house church, along with a single believing man. After years of working towards having a local fellowship of believers, it is beginning during a pandemic. In March, my country closed its borders and airport, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs stopped accepting and processing visa applications. So when the airport opened in September, I still could not return. In October, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs resumed processing visa applications. So I started the application process for a university student visa. As of this last week, the paperwork necessary to receive a visa when I arrive at the airport is ready. I plan to return to Central Asia in a month, where I will start studying language at the university right away and resume my normal life with my co-workers, local friends, and neighbors. In nine months, I hope to finish my language studies and be starting a new project through the Skills Training Center while being more involved in teaching and discipling local women. Bergfeldt, I can't do this without the body of Christ standing with me. Being near to you in the last eight months has refreshed and strengthened me. It has been good to see you face to face and to worship with you. Last week, as we began celebrating Advent, we lit the hope candle. The second candle we light this morning represents faith and is called Bethlehem's candle. Micah had foretold that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, which is also the birthplace of King David. Isaiah 43 to 5, a voice of one calling, In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. O Lord, how wrong I have been in the past to act as if Christ had never been born, as if he didn't perform miracles, as if he didn't take my every tear, my daily worries, my sin and insecurities on that cross, as if the tomb wasn't empty and the throne wasn't full of his presence and grace. It's that grace that gives meaning and power to your promises. I know that your word prevails even when our world turns black. I trust that your healing comes in different forms, stages, and ways. I believe that you promise to provide all we need. Seeking you doesn't require physical vision, complete health, or a life free of troubles, but instead a heart full of devotion and obedience, which I offer you today. No matter how many Advent seasons sweep by, Lord, your, remi- mar- your reminders remain the same. Each tear we cry has a purpose. Each trying stage has a divine reason, and in your capable hands, each icy rain of diversity is tr- adversity is transformed into the warmth of your grace. May we, and today and in this Advent season, be in repentance of our forgetting and ignoring of all the many blessings that have been set before us, mindful of who God is and what he has done for us. And may we never forget, no matter how bad the circumstances become, of how much God loves each and every one of us, no matter what we have done. May this be an encouragement today.
Now then, at this time, I'd like to call up Pastor James for the uh, message, and I'd just like to have a word of prayer for him before he commences. Lord, we just thank you once more for this day and just for Pastor James and his willingness to serve and uh, just for the energy he brings with him when he presents his messages. And uh, may you just uh, continue to uh, give him a joy in uh, his work and uh, just also continue to keep him safe in this time, this environment we live in. And uh, may you just... uh, Give him the words now, put them in his, on his tongue and as he speaks, and uh, may the Holy Spirit just uh, bless that word in the message that he has for us today. In your name, amen. Good morning. I want to welcome you all here to this morning's service, and I want to thank everyone for, that has taken part in the service thus far. If you've been keeping track in our uh, sermon series, we're making our way to the birthday of the Savior. And in doing so, we've considered five conversations that took place leading to Christmas Day. Last week, we looked at the conversation that took place between Zacharias and the angel Gabriel in Luke 1, verse 5 to 24. Today, we want to look at the conversation between Gabriel and Mary in Luke 1, verse 26. Two, verse 38. So if you have your Bibles, please follow along as I read. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. What a passage we would be looking at here this morning. Last week it was brought to our attention that this time period that we are looking at would have been roughly a very dark, dark time. The ruler was King Herod, a very cruel and devious king, which sets the stage for Israel to be in need of a savior We come to a time of six months, as it says in the scriptures. It would likely be close to six months since the time that the angel had visited Zacharias. This would have been how long Elizabeth had been pregnant with John since the conception took place. It is at this time that God felt the need to send an angel to bring news of his son's presence entering earth. But not just any angel, but once again, the angel Gabriel. The same one. That went to Zacharias. Now instead of meeting Mary in a busy crowded location. Such as a temple where the angel met with Zacharias. Gabriel meets up with Mary in a small town. Alone. At a private location. It is here also that Mary a young woman. Who is still a virgin was pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. Now to be pledged was taken much more seriously than. It would be uh, to becoming engaged today. For to be married took three steps. Step one was the engagement. This meant that the fathers would meet together to come to a formal agreement regarding the couples had in mind. Number two, the step two. After the agreement between father of the groom and bride of the groom, there would be father of the groom and bride of the groom, of the 
father of the groom and father of the bride, there was a ceremony that took place where mutual promises were made and to be upheld. And then finally, the third step, which took place approximately one year after the time of the agreement and ceremony. The bridegroom would come and take his bride at an unexpected time. At this time, the bridegroom would get on a camel, followed on foot with his family and friends in celebration. They would leave from his home and travel the nation, or however long the distance would be. They would travel by camel, the, the bridegroom on the camel, and everyone else on foot until they reached the bride's home. How long it would take would depend on how far away the bride lived from the bridegroom. It was about the trip. It was a, it signified something. It was about the trip, about how the bridegroom was coming for his bride. But it's interesting to note, she never went to go get him. It was always the bridegroom who went to get his bride. It was always the bridegroom getting the bride. When he reached her house... He would dismount the camel and was welcomed and it was continued celebration with continued celebration. They would lead them to a tent. And then the wedding ceremony would continue. But here we read that Mary was pledged to Joseph. In the pledge to be married, both bride and the groom to be, the bride to be and the groom to be were under strict obligation to be faithful to their soon to be spouse. Spouse. No physical intimacy between the two at this point. Physical intimacy would be considered fornication. And it would be considered a great shame. And considered, most importantly, sin. In biblical times, this type of pledge was as binding as marriage itself. And in the case of unfaithfulness between one or the other, divorce was a necessity to breaking off the engagement. And in the case of proof of unfaithfulness, there was possibility of punishment that would include a couple ways, and one of them, in fact, would end in death of the bride. So let's get back to the text. We see that Mary is pledged to Joseph. And that Joseph is of the line of David. A promise from where the Savior would come from the Old Testament. Matthew alludes to his prophecy multiple times. The Messiah would be from the king of the lineage of David. Something that the Jews of the day had been living in anticipation, having seen the Davidic kingdom taken away from them. As King Herod took the throne. And so now begins the conversation. When the angel meets with Mary, the first thing he says is, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Could you imagine ever having an angel come before you and speaking those words? Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you? Well, how does Mary respond? She's greatly troubled. We're not told why exactly she's troubled. One would surmise the visit itself from the angel could bring the feeling on, but we're not told. We are told, however, that Mary had wondered what kind of greeting this might be. So this young woman, she seems very smart, wise, very wise for her age. And with that, the angel offers comfort to Mary, who at this point is greatly troubled. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. In other words, do not fear, for the, for the Lord has bestowed a special honor on you. She would be a special recipient of God's grace. And the angel continues. You will be with child and give birth to a son. Whoa, okay, hang on. Wait a minute. I'm sure she's thinking about that in her head. I haven't been unfaithful to my future husband, and I haven't been unfaithful to God. I've been fully faithful to God. And now you're telling me I'm going to have a son? Well, that's exactly as the angel had said. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. 
We seem to find some similarities here if we consider last week's conversation between Zechariah and Gabriel. And now Mary's conversation with the angel. Zechariah was told he would have a son. Mary too has been told she would have a son. Zechariah was supposed to name him John. Mary was to name his son Jesus, her son, Jesus. So far, very close to the same. Well, not exactly. The birth of John from his parents, Zacharias and Elizabeth, would, well, they they would have, I'm sure, tried to have been having children to no avail for many years. And they heard in their old age of the miracle birth to come. John was going to be born to them. Mary had never engaged in physical intimacy, which I'm sure Zacharias and Elizabeth would have. Mary had never engaged in physical intimacy in her life, which would make that miracle that much greater. Which would make sense in how she would respond in a little bit. But for now, the angel continues. He will be great. Okay, hang on. Do you remember the conversation again from last week? Do you remember the conversation between Zacharias and the angel? The angel said his son would be great before the Lord. But what does the angel tell Mary? Well, continue reading. Jesus would be great and he would be called the son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. And with that, in a moment of pause, Mary's taking it all in. But she can't help but ask the critical question. Verse 34. Excuse me, how will this be since I am a virgin? How can this take place if I've never known a man? And verse 35 tells her what will take place. Gabriel says, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she was to, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I want to stop there for a moment and we want to reflect briefly on this conversation. Looking at nine points of interest. And you can find those bullet, those um, points in your bulletin or in the bulletin insert online. And they should be found there every Sunday um, as we are record, uh, as we are uh, able And so number one, the first thing we find of interest in this conversation. The birth that will take place will be like no other birth on earth. Like none other. You being a virgin, never having had physical intimacy with another man, and loving the Lord the way you do, would be just the right person along with Joseph to nurture and bring up in the womb and into childhood to be his mother. Mary, you're that person. God has chosen you. God will plant the seed. Number two, if we consider Miriam, Mary in, in, in what her name means, it means exalted, to be placed at a high, powerful level, to be given great stature, to be held in high regard. And in fact, Mary is also the name of the sister of Moses and Aaron. The importance that God places behind setting up for his son's arrival and allowing Mary to be a part of that. She was to be the suitor, the best suitor to be the mother of Jesus. However, I want to say though, not much time was in fact spent on emphasizing Mary in this conversation. But instead, emphasis is on baby Jesus. We need to keep that in mind. Very important to remember. Jesus is the one that came down to earth in that lowly stable. Jesus is the one 
that we can put our faith into. Jesus is the one that can save us. Jesus is the Savior, not Mary. So really, we should be starting with the awesome name the angel told Mary to call his, call this baby that she would have. Jesus. Jesus, which means deliverer, to rescue, savior. If we consider this definition by name, there is no other person more qualified, more able, more needed than Jesus who can offer salvation. When we consider the next thing, number four, when we look at verse 33, we find Gabriel pronounces that he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. The kingdom that Jesus is going to establish was going to be for all eternity, for all time. It would never come to an end. Number five, when we look at Mary in verse 34, we find no better example of being human than a virgin, pure and undefiled. A pure young lady. She was a perfect example of humanity and humility. Number six, when we look at verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. In this passage, when we read how the power of the Most High will overshadow you, the words overshadow you are very similar to how God would reveal his presence to the Israelites while walking with them in the wilderness those 40 years. The the cloud would come over the temple. The cloud would walk with them. We see that the power of the Most High explains to us that there's no other stronger than God himself. Number seven. When we look at the end of verse 35, we find that Jesus would be called the Son of God. In this definition, we find that Jesus was the most divine. He was most holy. What a perfect candidate to be God's Son. Number 8, verse 36. We then read of the baby that would be the Holy One. The baby would be the most righteous, perfect, pure child of God. For he was not only to be called the Son of God, but he was the Son of God. I would like to explain it as the offspring of God, but God himself, but it doesn't sit right for myself. So therefore, I would say God being himself in human form. And when we look at number nine, God was confirming his message through the angel. Verse 36, the angel at this point wants Mary wants to let Mary know that she may have heard some spectacular, astounding, miraculous news that was to take place. And then the angel affirms God's ability to bring life to earth by blessing her with even more great news. Elizabeth, your cousin, she's going to have a baby. The angel adds to the delight, you know your old cousin Elizabeth who had been barren all these years? That was a label that was given at the time. Well, God is going to do a miracle in her life as well. She's six months pregnant. For nothing is impossible with God. The angel offered Mary such sweet comfort in those five words. For nothing is impossible with God. Could you imagine how Mary felt in that moment? She had just heard of how God had chosen her to bear his son. And that he was the long-awaited savior that Israel had been waiting for. For 400 years, it seems as though God was silent. And now the promised Messiah was not only coming, but she was to bear that child. And then on top of that, to know of the many years that her cousin Elizabeth had longed to have children, and now being in their old age, she's finding out that she's going to have a baby. But not just any baby. And in taking it all in, the angel concludes with these words, What I have spoken to you is all true. What I shared with you is going to come to pass. What I have described to you will take place. For nothing is impossible For God. Nothing is impossible with God. 
in the scriptures this morning, what would seem most impossible is not only that a virgin would conceive from the Holy Spirit, what would seem more impossible is to know that God, our Creator, our Heavenly Father, the one who holds the breath in His hands, each and every one of us, He holds His breath, our breath in His hands. He knows exactly what's going to happen before we've even done it. He, know, he knew even before we were born what we would do. That he would, in knowing who he is, would see not only the need, but to follow through in sending a Savior to earth to pay for the sins of the world. That would seem even more impossible. But you know, these words are still, to this day, some of the sweetest words one could ever be reminded of. Nothing is impossible with God. Today we celebrate Christmas, the birth of the Christ child. You may have found yourself in a yucky predicament you thought you'd never be in. You may be going through a rough patch with your spouse. You may have been laid off indefinitely or fear of being laid off. You may have had to say goodbye to a loved one. You may have normally been the most cheery person, uh, but somehow you're struggling right now to keep a smile on your face in public and trying to hold it together for your family and for your children. But when you're alone, when you get that moment alone, you can't help but fall apart and the tears stream down your face. You may be finding yourself caught up in, in the media and the politics of everything going on today. So much so that you've lost your joy and every time you, every other thought has to do with worry. And as your thoughts jump all over the map, anxiety begins to creep in and build and build and build. And it's built so many walls that you can hardly even carry emotion anymore. The reality is that we have lived a very comfortable lives. We have lived very comfortable lives for a very long time. And in living in that comfort, we may have forgotten to consider what it could possibly include to follow Christ. And over time, not right away, but slowly, maybe every other day, we'd come to before the Lord, remind ourselves to live for Christ as gain, or to live, for, live, as, to live as Christ and to die as gain. And that we are called to die to self daily and to follow Christ in whatever he would have us do. And over time, though, we would find ourselves drifting further and further away from the Lord completely. But just like the Israelites, who had walked away from God so many times, we too have been given a promise. A promise. So I'd like to suggest to you that all we need to do is go to God and he'll take, all away, he'll take away the struggle. He'll take away the pain. He'll take away the circumstance. He'll take whatever you're dealing with. He'll take it away. Would I like to suggest that? I'd love to, but in keeping in mind that God... With God, all things are possible. I'd say that with confidence that whatever you are going through, God is allowing you to experience so that you can rely on Him, on His possibility and not our ability. So would He remove things from us just because we ask for it? No. But He wants us to grow from it. If we look at Mary, if we look at Mary which we'll find in a little bit, We'll see how and why she could respond the way she did. Just look at the scripture this morning. A virgin was going to give birth to the Messiah and Mary believed it. She didn't say, no way, no way, no way. This isn't a possibility. It cannot happen. And this is why Mary could in confidence respond to the news of her being chosen to raise the Christ child. Because when we trust in our God, the one who has no limit in what he can do, we can truly begin to live. The song that comes to mind is limitless. And in humility, Mary not gloating within, saying, Ha ha, Jesus, oh man, God chose me. Yeah, woo, yeah, not you. No. 
She's not gloating within, but beaming with anticipation. And she responds in verse 38. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. That's how she responded to the angel. In all that news that she received, she responded with, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. The question is, what are you, what are you doing about what's going on in your life? Right now. How are you handling things? God is allowing you to go through these things. But you know what? This is one of those affirmations where we can say, you know what, Lord? I'm going through some pretty, pretty dark, deep stuff. But I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. I can get through this because God is my Savior. This Christmas, may we find confidence, trust in the sovereignty of God as we celebrate the birth of the Christ child, the Savior of the world, Emmanuel, God with us. As we too hear that wonderful example of how the love of the Creator sent His Son, the King of kings, the the, the Lord of lords, according to Revelation, to be born in a lowly stable, to one day save the world from their sins. Wow, what great news. May we rejoice in that great news. Now I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Remember how the groom had to travel over lands or desert, whatever terrain he had to, terrain he had to, to get to his bride? 2,000 years ago, God, that bridegroom, traveled not over a desert or by swimming through lakes, climbing over mountains, but he traveled to earth through time and from heaven. And just like how the bride could never go to her bridegroom, so too we could never go to God. He had to come to us. That's why he sent Jesus. That's why he sent Jesus. Even today, he will come to our house. He will come to your life. He will come to your heart. But you have a choice. Will you let him in? How will you respond to him knocking? Today, Jesus is preparing his home for his bride. One day, Jesus is coming once again to travel through time and space to meet with his bride, the church, to take his bride home, to be with him for all eternity. What an amazing, amazing day that will be. Thank you, Lord, for that great Redeemer, Savior. For nothing is impossible with God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We thank you for making the impossible possible. We thank you for the way you sent the angel to bring Mary to the great amazing news of the child she would bear. A child that was the Messiah. A child that was a savior. A child that was a redeemer. A child that was a king. We thank you, Lord, for loving your bride, the church, and that you one day have promised to come for her. And Lord, for those that have ignored the knock on their heart's door from Jesus, may they open their hearts to him this Christmas. And may we, as we continue in our conversation leading to Christmas, be ever more fueled to be with our bridegroom and to share the good news and await his return. Bless each one who hears this message with your health, your protection, your love, your hope, and your joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Merry Christmas.